Las Vegas, Nevada, June 1st, 1989. 14-year-old Stephanie Isaacson walks to her local school. I was at work and I got a call that Stephanie hadn't gotten home from school and nobody had seen her all day. That same evening, the family's worst fears come true. As you're walking through that desert area, there's a lot of brush. And from walking through there, that's when the officer discovered her body. Three decades later, the horrific murder of this teen girl still profoundly affects the Las Vegas community. It's not often that you have a 14-year-old who is, you know, kidnapped, raped, and murdered on their way to school. Years pass, the case goes cold, the community still living in fear. Police wonder if this murder is the work of a serial killer. Initially, people did fear there was a serial killer on the loose that was targeting young children. 30 long years later, investigators pinning their hopes on new forensic science to hopefully crack this teen girl's murder. I'm Nancy Grace. This is Bloodline Detectives. Las Vegas, Nevada, a city in the desert. Bright lights, casinos, nightlife, and by reputation, a place where anything goes. I think a lot of people have a misconception, like people think anyone who lives in Las Vegas that they live in a casino and a hotel room on the strip, right? And Vegas is like any other city when you get off of the Las Vegas strip, when you get away from all the lights and the action in the casinos, the, the city's like any other city. Stephanie's father, John, works in the U.S. military. He's transferred to Las Vegas from Lincoln, Nebraska, where he was once stationed. It's not a place that I ever wanted to go. <laughs> it was very busy, not the kind of lifestyle I wanted to live, but I had a great time while I was there. Our relationship, from my perspective, was very, very close, and that was confirmed by all of her friends, and they all told me that she was very close to me and they all knew it. Very outgoing, very happy, and energetic. She, she loved the choir, she loved to sing. Her and her sister both. Aside from choir, Stephanie's other great love is for her younger sister, Joanne. One day, Stephanie was with two of her friends and I heard them talking and Joanne was around. They wanted to go to the mall. And Stephanie said, okay, let me get Joanne ready and we'll just go to the mall. And her friend said, no, we can't take her. And Stephanie said, if Joanne doesn't go, I don't go. <laughs> they were pretty close. The family's happy routine is shattered on a June morning, 1989. 14-year-old Stephanie leaves the house and begins her usual walk to school. It's just five blocks away. On June 1st, 1989, Stephanie Isaacson woke up to the sound of her alarm clock around 6.30 a.m. Her dad worked the overnight shift at a local military base. She got herself ready for school that day, left the house shortly after waking up at 6.30, and made the short walk to El Dorado High School. It was very common for students in that area to walk to school, and this was something that Stephanie did every single day. I was at work and I got a call that Stephanie hadn't gotten home from school. I said, well, she probably stopped off with some friends or they're playing or something. And I said, let me know when she gets home. Well, I got a call about an hour later that they had checked with all of her friends and called the school and nobody had seen her all day and the school never called me. I didn't call the police at that time but as I was walking out, I went by my boss's office and I said, my daughter is missing. I'm going to go look for her. I called my buddy and him and his wife and another friend of ours showed up 
and we discussed what we were going to do. So we got on horseback and started looking. As they're riding on the horse, they discovered her book bag and her books. And you find her belongings in a desert area. You know this is not a runaway type situation. That in itself escalates the type of call that it is. And that is what prompted Metro Police to bring out additional resources. And there was a helicopter involved. There was a canine search. Not long into the search, an officer from the canine unit makes a horrific discovery. Basically, you have a lot of desert area, even in that time in the late 80s in the inner city of Las Vegas. And as you're walking through that desert area, there's a lot of brush, you know, we'll call it tumbleweeds and, you know, weeds that are pretty much waist high. And from walking through there, that's when the officer discovered her body that um, was laying in the field. It was really difficult, a lot of crying. I had my ex-wife, the mother of Stephanie, and four or five friends over. And the first thing I did when we got back in the apartment is I called the radio station and uh, had them play their favorite song was Wind Beneath My Wings by uh, Bette Midler, I think it was. Police began sifting through the scene, collecting what evidence they can. We investigated the scene and supervised the collection of evidence. There uh, really wasn't any uh, witnesses to anything, so we had nothing like that to go on. So the, the crime scene was the most important thing to process, and that's what we spent most of the time doing. So when they found her, there was orange carpet that had been discarded in the desert area, and it was covering her body. And at that point, that's when they stopped and they notified the homicide investigators who then came and took over the investigation. How it works is the homicide investigators will respond with our CSI investigators for the initial response. So once overall photographs are taken, the scene is documented, then homicide is gonna request the coroner investigator to come to the scene. And that's what happened here, is the coroner eventually responds to the scene along with the mortuary and they take control of the scene at that point. Stephanie's family struggles to process their huge loss. They're comforted by friends, colleagues, and the military community in Vegas and that in Lincoln, Nebraska. Usually when that happens, you get a humanitarian reassignment, you have to apply for it, but the Air Force contacted me and said, where do you want to go? I organized a funeral for all of Stephanie's friends and made sure that her mother knew about it. I only had just one funeral, but I had two because I'm originally from Nebraska, Lincoln area, and I actually had Stephanie shipped to Lincoln and we did another memorial service there and then buried her at Lincoln Memorial Park in Lincoln, Nebraska. After Stephanie Isaacson's funeral, her father, John, makes a touching and unusual gesture to Stephanie's grieving friends. He lets them visit her bedroom so they can each take away a memento from his girl's brief life. My thing was I have the memories and the pictures so I was okay with them taking whatever they wanted to for a memento for themselves. 30 years after Stephanie's brutal murder, Detective Ray Spencer, a veteran homicide investigator who grew up in Vegas, still recalls every detail of Stephanie's murder case. In 1989, I was at Gibson Middle School when Stephanie was murdered. This was very big news that I, even I remembered from being a little boy growing up here in Las Vegas. It's not often that you have a 14-year-old who is, you know, kidnapped, raped, and murdered on their way to school here in Las Vegas. Police are desperate to find teen girl Stephanie Isaacson's killer. As we see next on Bloodline Detectives, it will take years and remarkable science for that to happen. Las Vegas, Nevada, 1989, June 1. 14-year-old Stephanie Isaacson sets off on her way to school. She never makes it. Later that evening, Stephanie's body discovered in brush on the edge of the city. Stephanie has been sex assaulted and murdered. 
When you're conducting a homicide investigation, you're looking for any and all evidence, and it could be trace evidence from hairs, fibers, cigarette butts, clothing, anything that's nearby. And it's many different cases that we've investigated that you pick up things that you're not even sure if it belongs there, but you pick it up because you want to make sure you don't miss anything. The discovery of the book and backpack before the discovery of Stephanie's body was significant. It told investigators that the location of the books and backpack was likely where the attack first happened, causing Stephanie to drop her books and then to have the assault and murder take place somewhere else. You could tell when the scene was being processed that the sneakers were found away and that she had been dragged to her current location where they found her. Shoe impressions was one of the main things we looked for because I don't recall any vehicle, motorcycle or bicycle or anything like that being suspected as being part of it. When you're processing the crime scene, there's not much evidence at the time to move forward with. We obviously are gonna take blood evidence, we're gonna take fingerprints, we're gonna take anything that's near the crime scene, but the things at that point, you start conducting what we call a grid search and we start working our way out from the crime scene. And we'll go out there the next day at about the same time because maybe there's a person who goes jogging every morning at 7 a.m. and we'll stop that person the next day and ask them, did you see anything? Did you see anybody? The crime scene produces very few hard clues. Investigators hope and pray Stephanie's autopsy will reveal meaningful evidence. The forensic pathologist ruled her death a homicide and attributed her death to blunt force injuries and strangulation. There's indications on Stephanie's body that were uncovered at the autopsy that she put up a fight against her killer, that she fought all the way to the end. They're all uh, a little uncomfortable. It's not your most pleasant experience. I attended maybe 400 autopsies in my career. You know, I had children that same age as Stephanie at the time, so it was particularly unnerving. Back in 1989, DNA technology is still in its infancy and forensic science was not as developed as it is today. So the team investigating Stephanie Isaacson's murder relies on old school police methods. We're gonna go to the school, we're gonna talk to her friends, we're gonna talk to neighbors because you have to build a pattern of life leading up to the actual homicide. You can't rule out any other potentials, like was she meeting somebody? Was there somebody that she knew? Did she walk to school by herself? The first people the police went out to speak to were the neighbors, the people that lived inside of Stephanie's father's apartment. They wanted to find out what these people knew and if they had seen something the morning that Stephanie was killed. The police learned that an unknown vehicle was parked in the area on the morning of Stephanie's murder. Unfortunately, when police spoke with these neighbors, they were unable to provide them with the make, the model, any identifying features of this car for the police to be able to pursue it further. Investigators reach out to other law enforcement agencies for help. We worked with the FBI as we often do. So in a lot of cases, when you when what you have is the behavioral analysis unit with the FBI, they offer assistance and they have a program that they're able to give you a type of suspect that you're looking for. And in this situation, the FBI did provide assistance, but it was a very generic suspect profile that was given. I would say he's the epitome of evil. Somebody who's able to attack a 14-year-old girl and sexually assault her and strangle her and leave her in a desert is a vile human being to me. Weeks turn into months, and one by one, potential leads turn into dead ends. The case remains officially open, but in reality, it stalled. We had a lot of leads, but nothing that was viable. We followed up on every lead that we had, but all those leads brought us to dead ends. And, you know, people had alibis or people were not in the area, but there was nothing that 
came in Stephanie's case that would lead us to any potential suspects. The case went cold within the first few months of investigating. As soon as the tips had dried up, as soon as the FBI's profile didn't generate any suspects, the Las Vegas Police Department found themselves at square one. They had not made any arrests in the case. They had not even identified a person as a suspect. Stephanie Isaacson's case stays cold for many, many years, but then, 2007, New forensic DNA science offers hope. The cold case team is able to retrieve semen from Stephanie's shirt. We actually had a grant that allowed us to look through a lot of cold cases. That grant that we were working on during that time, Stephanie's case was one of those cases and we did discover DNA on her shirt during that. Their hope quickly turns to disappointment. The DNA sample pulled from Stephanie's t-shirt, which came from a semen sample, was run through CODIS, the National DNA Database. When that sample was run and compared to samples of any known individual, the results came back with not a match. It did not match anyone in the database. Cold case detectives refused to give up. 30 long years after Stephanie's murder, there are more advances in DNA investigative techniques. That's next on Bloodline Detectives. Las Vegas, Nevada, June 1, 1989. 14 year old Stephanie Isaacson leaves home for her usual walk to school. She never makes it. Her dead body, sex assaulted, discovered in the desert nearby. The murder investigation goes cold, but now, 30 years later, a new generation of Vegas detectives try to finally crack this case. When I took over in the homicide section in 2018, Stephanie's case is one of the cold cases that was being worked. And I brought on a new investigator who came to our cold case section. And Stephanie's case is one of the cases that I assigned to her to specifically work. It's frustrating when you have DNA evidence, but you don't have a suspect. That's the one thing that stands out when you have that type of evidence and yet you, you have a case that you haven't solved. When you look at a case from 1989 where a 14 year old is raped and murdered and there are no real viable leads and it's still unsolved, it's still a very frustrating case as an investigator. For a long time, I didn't hear from anybody. So I made it a point to call them and I would get updates. Terry Miller, I made the plan with her that I called her every six months for updates for the past, what, three or four years. And I would do that. But prior to that, I didn't get many calls from anybody. So we keep everything close to the chest. I mean, we talk with the family and we let them know that, you know, we're going to look at some different potentials, but you don't want to get the family's hopes up too much. And that's always, you know, a concern. When you talk with a mom or you talk with a dad, you don't want to let their hopes get too high, especially on something on a case where you even had doubts originally. The investigation gets a boost from a newly formed nonprofit organization, the Vegas Justice League. This amazing group of concerned citizens provides funding to help police crack cold cases. The Vegas Justice League was created by Justin Wu, and it's this concept that kind of developed on its own of helping out and facilitating cold case solves. We're basically like-minded people who want to help the community donate $5,000, which is the exact amount it takes to fund a case, send it to Authram Labs in Houston, Texas, and then Authram Labs reaches out to LVMPD, for example, and they ask for cold cases and they say, hey, we have funding, we can help out. We know that you have a lot of cases. What can we do? What can we do to lighten the load? I saw on social media what Authram had been doing with these DNA cases around the United States. And I reached out to them and I said, you know, we would be interested in funding a case, but the one condition would be that we'd want the cases to be in Las Vegas area, because this is where we live. We get a huge break, and that break 
originally comes from Justin Wu, who he at the time was an anonymous donor. Uh, that anonymous donor had donated money to a laboratory that does genetic genealogy. Authorum is a lab that's purpose-built to identify victims and perpetrators from forensic evidence found at crime scenes. We look at evidence that is found at a crime scene and we analyze the DNA and identify either the perpetrator or the victim that left that DNA at the crime scene. Request is our system in which we communicate with law enforcement and we're able to track the process from the time the evidence is received all the way to the conclusion of the case. And so they entered the case and we looked at it and that case is, is an extremely difficult case. There's very little DNA left. DNA is consumable. Every time you run one of these reactions, you actually destroy that part of the DNA. And so when you're working with such little amounts of DNA as what was left in the Stephanie Isaacson case, you know that you're gonna consume most, if not all, the evidence. If your process doesn't lead to the identification of the perpetrator, then you've taken away the last chance that that person has for justice. It was one of the hardest decisions that I've ever had to make as an investigative lieutenant because we had very, very little DNA evidence and we knew that if we were going to trust this lab to do the work, that it would potentially consume the last piece of evidence in this case. We were able to do our QC process and it did pass and so we decided to proceed with the case. There was only 0.12 nanograms of DNA. That's the equivalent of about 15 human cells. If I touch my hand, I've left hundreds of cells. So 15 human cells from 32 years ago. Investigators decide to take a huge gamble. They process the last remaining DNA sample left behind by Stephanie's killer. It's a high risk strategy. If it succeeds, the killer is identified. If it fails, he will likely never face justice. It was pretty clear that this was gonna be the last shot for solving Stephanie's case, that the little amount of DNA that was still remaining in this case, if this didn't work, if they could not generate a profile from that sample, this was, this was going to be the, the end of the road. Do we take the risk to see if this potential DNA can solve Stephanie's murder. I knew that if we're not able to get answers from Othram, we're never gonna get the answers. The tiny DNA sample passes a quality test and is then sent for a process called genome sequencing. Genome sequencing is when you look at the letters in the DNA sequence, it's kind of like taking a picture of what is in the DNA and being able to understand more about what comprises that DNA. DNA sequencing that's particularly cost-effective and high throughput is you can now measure hundreds of thousands to millions of markers. And so what we do at Authram is we're measuring hundreds of thousands of markers and in each of these markers help collect another little piece of information about a crime scene that in, in kind of uh, aggregate can be used to learn something about the person who contributed that DNA. We sequence through the DNA and look at hundreds and hundreds of thousands of markers, build one of these profiles that we call a high-performing DNA profile. I call it high-performing because a lot of the times profiles are built, but a lot of it is noise, and they're not really something that you can upload to a genealogical database and actually get hits that will help you get an identity. So at Authram, we work really hard to build these high-performing DNA profiles or very clean profiles. We upload them to genealogical databases that are allowed and consented for law enforcement use. And then we perform forensic genetic genealogy until we're able to get to an identity or maybe a set of identities. And then we call law enforcement with that investigative lead and law enforcement continues their investigation on the case. We'll advertise roughly 12 weeks from evidence hitting our doorstep to building a profile. And that profile consists of these DNA markers, each one of which contribute to us understanding something about the contributor to that DNA. That process is about 12 weeks. It involves DNA extraction, it involves a QC step, 
It might even involve some iterative repair and enrichment and, and filtering of the DNA to make sure that we've got the best possible sample of that DNA to proceed to DNA testing. And then it includes that testing process and the computer work necessary to build that map of markers. Then the second part in which we use it in, in some way to then infer identity, that might be through a genealogical search. It might be through one-to-one -one comparisons. If we have, for example, a familial reference, uh, DNA swab from someone that thinks they might be related. Those kind of processes can take anywhere from hours to weeks. Some of the harder projects can take months, but we generally will return leads to the investigator within the same year that we get the casework. The forensic genetic genealogy team at Authram Labs works overtime. Finally, a breakthrough. When we took the case, I think they were very hopeful that we would you know, yield some insight in the case but I don't think the expectations were very high. And then they were certainly surprised to hear from us when we called them and told them that uh, not only was the profile creation successful, but you know, within a few months of, uh, of genealogy that was performed in-house at Authram, we were able to narrow in on, on, a, on, a, on a very likely candidate, someone that we wanted to exclude as we explained to them. When we did call them and David was the one that called them, they were so excited. To them, it was, unbelievable that there was an answer all of a sudden. After all these years of, of working this investigation, it was very exciting. And then when we gave them the name, they were able to look up that this person was actually accused of very similar crime. Three years before, he was tried for that crime and actually the charge was dismissed. And so now they knew for sure that he was probably responsible for both crimes. The forensic scientists at Othram Labs can identify a prime suspect for Stephanie Isaacson's murder. But can police ever track him down? That's next on Bloodline Detectives. Las Vegas, Nevada, 2019. Nearly 30 years after 14-year-old Stephanie Isaacson found sex assaulted and murdered, finally, a breakthrough in the case. A nonprofit called the Vegas Justice League makes a generous donation to Authram Labs. That money pays for research using forensic genetic genealogy. The ultimate result that they get is that the profile came to two possible matches. They received two relatives that were related to that DNA sample. From those two relatives, they were able to pinpoint their suspect. Darren Merchant was a Las Vegas resident. He was 23 years old at the time of Stephanie's murder. He was very close by to where Stephanie had lived. And he was someone that wasn't a stranger to the Las Vegas police. The Las Vegas police knew the name of Merchant Othram calls our office and talks to my detective. And Terry runs into my office and she's like, you know, jump, basically jumping up and down. And she's so excited that we have a solve in Stephanie's case. She comes in, she gives me Darren Marchant's name. And I'm like, well, who is he? Explain. And so at that point, we hadn't even really done much of a suspect workup on him at that point. And we started digging into his background. We knew that he was in Las Vegas during the time that Stephanie was murdered. And we also knew that he had prior involvement in the criminal justice system too. In 1976, he had been involved in a sexual assault just outside Las Vegas at the Lake Mead National Park. He had been previously arrested and accused of another murder just three years before Stephanie's. In that particular case, he was accused of, of killing a 24-year-old woman who he had spent the night with. He was arrested and charged, but was ultimately dismissed for a lack of evidence. That was never brought to our attention, and I was a little upset about that because it was handled by another team in my unit. No one ever brought that to my attention. She indicated that the circumstances were nowhere uh, even close to the same as Stephanie Ivington. I asked him if, if he had done anything else, and they told me about a case three years prior that they had arrested him for, and it was a court system said, we don't have enough evidence to prosecute, 
So they turned him loose and then three years later, he killed Stephanie. And then after they confirmed that it was him for Stephanie, they confirmed that it was him that did the one three years prior also. I was pissed. The police officers, there isn't much I can say to them. They did their job and arrested him in the beginning. Whatever happened on the prosecuting side, which I don't have all those details, that's some of the stuff that I ask about, but I couldn't get any of that information. Darren Marchand becomes the prime suspect for the 30-year-old murder of teen girl Stephanie Isaacson. Investigators believe they're close to making an arrest. As we see next on Bloodline Detectives, they will face one more frustration. Las Vegas, Nevada, 2019. After 30 long years, bloodline detectives identify a prime suspect in the murder of teen girl Stephanie Isaacson. His name, Darren Marchand. At first, investigators are overjoyed. Then they get unexpected news. Unfortunately for the police, as well as unfortunately for Stephanie's family, that he committed suicide in 1995. And by the time of his identification, he was dead. That same morning is when we found out that he was no longer alive. And it's frustrating because you, you get so excited that you have a suspect, but now you have a suspect that you're not going to be able to bring uh, any criminal prosecution to. Darren Martian's suicide allows him to evade justice without ever being questioned about Stephanie Isaacson's murder. It's like I told a newspaper reporter, that son of a cheated me twice, once when he killed her and once when he hung himself. I wanted to face him. I didn't have anything planned. I'm one of those that I would rather look you in the eye and let you know who I am. For the family, you want that person to be prosecuted and held accountable. And, you know, in Stephanie's case, we're never going to be able to bring him to trial, and he's never going to be held for those charges. But the good part is we know what happened, and we know who did it. It's absolutely heartbreaking, and there's that sense that there is no justice. This family has spent years looking for a name, looking for a person that they could hold responsible for killing their daughter. And once they find out who this person is, they're no longer here, they're no longer able to have their day in court, and they're no longer here to be able to answer for themselves. Bloodline detectives are disappointed they'll never be able to bring Stephanie Isaacson's killer to justice. It's a moment for them. They must maintain perspective. You're always doing this job for the families, right? Like, it's a very, very hard and difficult job as a homicide investigator. But when you're able to give justice to the families, that's what keeps homicide investigators going and working uh, on their next case. And it, the sense of accomplishment and the sense of pride, you'll never forget when you give justice to a family that otherwise thought that they would never receive it. It's exciting, you know, when you're 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 proud, but you're also, you know, you're still very sad because you have a family that has lost a loved one. There are other unsolved sexual assaults. There are other unsolved murders. Stephanie Isaacson is one of them, and I think it really speaks to the tenacity of the police department that even after three decades that they didn't give up. They didn't give up hope that one day they would find out. Stephanie Isaacson is anyone's 14-year-old daughter walking to school that day. So there was something about her case that just really stood out to investigators that they had to solve this one. Detective Ray Spencer and his team hold a press conference to announce to the Vegas community they finally can close the Stephanie Isaacson murder. We have identified Darren Roy Marchin, who has been positively identified as the person who sexually assaulted and murdered Stephanie in 1989. The LVMPD would like to thank Othram Laboratory for their hard work on this very difficult case. But the biggest thank you goes to the generous donor, who is Justin Wu, who made all of this possible. Not only Stephanie's family and friends, but our community 
finally has closure for this horrible crime. The incredible advancements in forensic science are breathtaking, but they're only as good as the efforts of investigators at the crime scene, sometimes 30, 40, even 50 years before. The most important factor in those efforts is the very careful detection and preservation of evidence. I'm very proud of those original investigators because, you know, they did a phenomenal job on this case. And when you look through and you look at how they preserved evidence that at the time, they had no idea what DNA was. And you have no idea that this is going to be the, the thing that solves the case 30 plus years later. And it's because of that type of work that we're able to solve this case. It's incredible what the first responding officers did back in 1989. Our ability to test and process forensic evidence, including DNA evidence, was nowhere near where it is today. So for the first responding officers in 1989 to have the insight into, they might not be able to test it now, but to have the insight that the technology is going to eventually catch up where they will be able to retest evidence. This was a landmark achievement. Othram scientists set a record for the least amount of DNA ever used to solve a case. It's less than one nanogram. That's one billionth of a gram, an unimaginably tiny speck of DNA. Othram's work in this case is, is huge. Stephanie's case would not be solved. We would not know her killer without the work of Othram. Having the tools to be able to test this level of DNA and then be able to generate a profile from it. This is a case for the history books. This was a cold case, a homicide case, decades into investigating that only had the equivalent of 15 human cells to be able to identify a killer. I can't say enough things. I'm truly a fan and a believer in the work they're doing, and they're proving it. They have a website called dnasolves.com, and in that site you can see beyond Vegas that they've been solving cases all across the U.S., and I just, I think they're incredible. We never solve this case without forensic genealogy. If we don't have the capabilities to do the work that Othram Labs does, this case never gets solved. It's so important because the capabilities of solving so many future unsolved murders are endless with the use of genealogy work. The other partner in this cold case breakthrough is Justin Wu at the Vegas Justice League team. Justin's work is tremendous. He's providing financial support to law enforcement agencies, particularly within the Las Vegas community, and to use those resources to solve the coldest of cold cases. I think it's very tangible that we could theoretically eliminate all of the cold cases with DNA in the Las Vegas market. I've heard that that number is around 100, and I think that that's something, you know, over the next couple years even, that we could potentially raise the funds for to, you know, eliminate all of the cold cases for them. The team of investigators and scientists are naturally relieved to crack the case. Meanwhile, Stephanie Isaacson's family is left with memories. Her smile and her personality, she was my girl. People said that we, we acted a lot alike and enjoyed the same thing, so we were very much alike. The horseback riding, that Mustang that I bought her, she wouldn't get very far from the barn and that horse would throw her and she'd come walking back <laughs> and put him away. <laughs> but it happened every time that she was out. And she loved to be out like I did. She would go down to the swimming pool and meet her friends in the apartment complex we moved in. She'd be on the phone talking to her friends. Just lots of good stuff. In the future, scientists at Othram Labs believe more grieving families can be helped by this technological breakthrough. I truly feel a product that's going to change the way that law enforcement does a lot of these investigations and hopefully allow us to live in a world with no more cold cases at all.
where everyone has answers for what happened to their loved one and no one has to wait decades to find out what happened to their loved one in the future. A world where perpetrators are scared to commit a crime because they know that if they've left DNA, it's a matter of time before they're caught. The murder of 14-year-old girl Stephanie Isaacson is tragic. It did, however, bring together well-intentioned people willing to take on her case and other cases like hers. The cooperation of law enforcement with scientists at Authoran and with the incredible Vegas Justice League team should be an inspiration to all of us. It is to me. I'm Nancy Grace. Thank you for being with us here at Bloodline Detectives.